All right, everyone, it's 10 o'clock. Let's get my screen organized. Here we go. Now I got the right one. Okay, it's 10 a.m. We're going to get started. I wanted to make sure everybody knew. I said it a few minutes ago, but for those of you that weren't on initially, you do not need to have the FAR bar contract handy today. I am going to email everybody my annotated uh, contract afterwards. So you're going to have my notes and everything. So don't, don't worry about that. Just go ahead, listen, ask questions. Feel free to participate as you see, uh, as you see fit. We are going to be talking about the FAR bar contract and uh, the addenda today. I'm very excited because we're going to go in detail. Uh, of course, for those of you that have been on my calls before, you know that we start off with a disclaimer. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. And I am giving you information, but not legal advice. Just give me a call and we can set up a consultation if you have specific questions. A little bit about me and my practice. Um, we founded this firm and I founded this firm in 2007 to focus on real estate and business law. We have a full service litigation department. We have offices throughout Southwest Florida, but we do closings across the state of Florida. Uh, I've worked with many of you. I can see a lot of familiar names on here. If you have any questions or, or concerns, just give me a call. I'm happy to help everybody out, get your closings done for you as uh, expeditiously as possible. I know everyone's time is valuable, so we're going to dive right into the uh, contract today. Can everybody see the residential contracts? See heads shaking, that means yes. All righty, so let's just dive right into this and start talking about this contract. This is the Florida Bar, Florida Realtor contract put together by a joint committee of the Bar and the uh, Florida Realtors. It's an excellent contract. Uh, I like using it, although I have some concerns and we'll talk about them today. Um, going to move through some of the basic stuff uh, and talk about the inspections and some of the other things in a little bit more detail on the addenda. So first off, right away at the beginning, we have our buyer and our seller lines. Uh, I've talked about this many times. The seller, of course, is the easy one to figure out unless if you've got an LLC or a trust involved because you just go to the prior deed and look and see who your seller is. If the seller is an LLC, of course, you need to know who signs for the LLC, who has the authority to bind the LLC. If you have a trust, you can look to the trustees, but if there's a successor trustee that's not in the public record, you're gonna have to get with the listing agent when you make your offer and um, see, see who is the successor trustee if so-and-so has passed away. Maybe when you're looking through the public record, you see a death certificate or something, and that calls into question who the actual seller of the property is. Of course, if you've got a probate involved, if the seller has actually passed away and it's not in trust or not in an LLC or other some other vehicle, then you're going to need a probate and it's going to be tougher to get the property sold quickly because you have to open the probate and get the personal representative letters prior to um, actually um, prior to actually uh, signing the contract because there's no one available to sign as the quote unquote seller until until those PR letters have been issued. And of course the buyer is the buyer and it can be an LLC or a trust or a partnership or whatever you want it to be. And that's, that's the customer that that's easy to know. Um, Next up, we have the property description. Very important that we put in the street address, the proper county, the tax ID number, and the brief legal description of the property from the property appraiser's website. Um, it's not important that you have the complete legal description unless you, have, unless you have a very complicated legal description like multiple parcels, long meets and bounds descriptions that don't fit in the blank. In that case, you would write C attached in here and you would add 
the complete legal description, especially on the uh, on a larger property, a more expensive property, we need to be more precise. You would want to make sure that you have the complete legal description of the property so we know what's being sold and you would attach that as like exhibit A. Just write exhibit C attached exhibit A, attach it to the contract and get it signed. Under this contract, um, it's not as specific as for example, the neighbor contract uh, that talks about the specific fixtures and, and washer and dryer and things that are that are included. This just says improvements and fixtures, including built-in appliances, furnishings, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. That's your definition of the property. That's what you're selling. In addition, you have personal property that comes with this contract, and it's listed here. But note, and I've got notes here on the side. I wonder if I can make it so we can see my notes. Let's see here. Yeah. So I've got notes here on the side. The washer and dryer are not in this in this uh, uh, list. So if you would like to convey the washer and dryer, or if you have the buyer and you say to the buyer, "Hey, the washer and dryer convey," and you do not wish to purchase your your buyer a new washer and dryer, then write in in this blank here, washer and dryer. Um, Note that the personal property has no contributory value. This is a, a for the lenders. Lenders don't make loans on personal property. They make loans on real property. So they want nothing of value for the personal property that conveys. Uh, Kim is asking about what about microwaves? Well, my, if you would like your microwave to convey, if it's not a built-in, which built-in appliances are here, but if you if you would like a uh, countertop microwave to convey, you need to write that in. Up next, you're going to want to put in your, um, your purchase price, of course, goes here. And you put in, um, you know, the total value of the, per of the, of the purchase. This is the, what the commission is based off of. This is what the doc stamps are based off of. This is what the title insurance is based off of. Up next, you put in your uh, initial escrow amount here. Don't forget to check the box to say how long the buyer has to make their initial deposit. That goes here. If you don't check this, then it's a question as to when is the initial deposit due. It says three days after the effective date. That's typically fine. Um, but if you're in a competitive situation, you may want to move that up a little bit to get that deposit in. Although I'm going to say this and then get, get, get calls later. If you miss, if you put in three days or five days, you cannot come back later and say, I don't have a contract until the deposit is made. Because there's plenty of consideration in this contract already for the parties. So if you give if you give too long for the deposit uh, to be made, you run the risk of of the buyer maybe not making the deposit. Of course, in this contract, that would subject the buyer to a damages lawsuit. So you have to be very careful there. Fill in your escrow agent name, address, phone number. That's very important. The rule says you have to do that. It's um, uh, Florida Administrative Code rule that requires you to put the escrow contact information in. I conveniently put my information in there so you can see what it looks like. Then you've got your additional deposit, and then you've got your, your financing. I cannot express how important this blank is right here, highlighted with the blue line. You must, if you're financing your property, please, please, please put an amount that's being financed in this blank, otherwise you don't have a financing contingency under the LaFont case, and your buyer is probably going to lose their deposit if they don't get the loan. So be very careful there. The other thing you have to note up right here at the beginning, they talk about collected funds. I'm going to talk about this a couple of times as we go through the contract. But collected funds means your buyer needs to be prepared to use Fed wires, not checks. Cash is okay for the initial deposit, but not for the closing proceeds. Too much cash uh, triggers triggers IRS issues. So wires, 
Buyers need to send, not ACHs, wires. Buyers need to send wires for proceeds for closing under this contract, really under all of the contracts. Farbar requires it, Nabor requires it, the as is requires it. Um, so that's the purchase price section there. Up next, we talk about the time for acceptance. Um, you put a date in here for how long you would like the to give your seller, assuming the buyer is making the offer, you want your seller to respond by. If not, the offer is withdrawn and the deposit, if made, is returned to the buyer. But remember, under this contract, you need an executed copy signed by the buyer and seller and delivered. I'm going to say this again, delivered, it's in here twice, um, to get this contract to be effective. And it's very, very important that you get the, the fully executed contract over to the um, other side as quickly as possible because the effective date is the delivery date. Okay, and this closing date is up next. So the closing of this transaction shall occur when all funds required for closing are received by the closing agent and collected and all the closing documents required to be furnished by each party and are delivered. So that means that the closing occurs on the date that you pick here below, right here. Once on the day of the closing, on the day of the closing, once all of the documents and money are received by the title company or the closing agent. Um, it's very important that everything be into the escrow agent, the closing agent, the closing attorney, whatever you call it or however you use it on time. Otherwise, there's going to be a breach of contract. Okay, before I move on to the extensions, I have a question. If the purchase price changes, should you make sure to alter the financing and balance to close figures and the consequences if you don't? That is an excellent question, Teresa. I'm going to talk about that more under the financing section. But absolutely, if you have a different number, particularly one that is going to be um, less than the amount you put here under the financing, you need to do a contract amendment so that you stay in compliance with the LaFont case, which I'll, again, I'll talk about later. But basically what LaFont said is if you apply for a loan that is other than the loan stated in the contract, you don't have a finance contingency. That's the simplest way to say that case. It's a very bad case. It really caused them to reconfigure this contract's financing terms. But in my personal opinion, they didn't quite get it right. And you still have a problem. And you need to modify, amend the contract if you do not have uh, financing on the terms stated in the contract. But again, when you get to Section 8, we'll talk about that some more. So um, let's talk about extensions under Section 5 real fast. And Larry, I'll get to your question about the escrow agent in a minute in section nine. But um, under the extensions, so if the buyer, the closing funds from the buyer's lender are not available on the closing date due to Consumer Financial Protection Bureau closing disclosure delivery requirements, if paragraph 8B is checked, loan approval has been obtained and lender's underwriting is complete, then the buyer may get seven additional days. So I want to point this out real fast because I get a lot of questions about, well, I have seven more days. Or under Nabor, I have 10 more days. Nabor standard is different than this one. This one is very complicated. You have to have, um, first off, a finance contingency has to be, has to be in this contract. Second, Loan approval, which is a defined term in the contract, has to have been obtained, and the lender's underwriting has to be complete, which means that it's basically clear to close. We're waiting on the final settlement statement. The CD has to be signed. You know, the three-day the three-day rule under the new under the new um, CFPB requirements. So it's not a simple. Well, I'm just working on my loan still. You've got to be done with the loan, ready to go, just waiting on the CD to get signed and cleared. Um, 
lender underwriting has to be complete. And so you may need a statement from the lender that underwriting is complete. Um, the other way to extend this contract is through force majeure. We'll talk about that when we get to the force majeure section, but the standard G does allow for an extension. And interestingly in this contract, we'll talk about it as one other place that can give you an extension um, without, an without an amendment. And we'll talk about that when we get there, but it's not listed here under section five. So the committee needs to work on that. Let's talk about occupancy and possession. Unless um, the property is leased, which we talk about in 6B, 6A says that you get occupancy and possession free of tenants, occupants, and future tenancies at closing. And the seller is to have removed all personal items and trash. So that's the standard under this contract for what the property needs to look like. No personal items and trash, except what you've negotiated to leave. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, also you have to have the, uh, the seller has to perform the maintenance and they've got to leave the property in its condition at, at the time of taking occupancy, unless there are maintenance items that have to be fixed. So let's talk about properties subject to leases. Uh, if you do deal with a lot of investment properties, then you're gonna have leases in place. You have five days after the effective date to get all the leases on the property to the um, buyer to review. The buyer then has five days in their sole discretion to determine whether they like the leases and either terminate the contract or be prepared to move forward. Um, and then the one thing they added to this contract recently is that the seller needs to provide a stop. They've always had to provide a stop letters saying that the tenant is current, what the rent is, what the security deposit being held is, what the term of the lease is, things like that. But that's no longer required for short term or vacation rental. So if you're buying in a vacation rental and you've got six or seven upcoming rentals, you don't need six or seven estoppels which makes it a little easier to get the property transferred. Um, let's see here, we got a couple of questions. Joe was asking about future tenancies. What happens if an individual has a future lease, but the current owner sells to me? Joe, you have to honor the lease. If you take subject to a lease, you have to honor the lease. If, you, if this box here uh, is not checked uh, on paragraph 6B, then the seller would be in breach of contract if they cannot deliver the lease, the, the, deliver the property free of all tenancies. So it depends on whether 6B is checked or not. If it's checked, subject to lease. If it's not, seller is in breach. Okay, um, we have another question on personal property. Um, does it have to be listed? And what about turnkey? You have to list everything. Tony, what I say when people say turnkey on a contract, I say, what does that mean? Does that mean they're only taking their toothbrush and they're leaving the bed sheets? What about their clothes? It's a very amorphous term, turnkey, furnished, as seen on such and such a date. The safest, best practice is also the most frustrating one, um, is to do an inventory. Take pictures, write down, count the forks and spoons in the drawer if that's what's being conveyed. And I know that's frustrating, and I know that's a lawyerly thing to say, but it really is the best practice to avoid fights later. And I've had $40,000 chandeliers get taken. I've had special lamps that were uh, 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 grandma's lamp that was supposed to be left that got taken by the seller and fight over that. So it's a very important conversation to have. It's a good question, Tony. It's an important conversation to have with your seller what are you going to leave? Uh, what are you going to take with you? And be very clear with your buyer up front. Um, Francie's asked about TV mounts. If you, if it's glued or screwed, it stays. So the TV mount would stay. But if we look up here, TVs are not listed. It just says fixtures and built-in appliances, built-in furnishings. So 
if you've got a television that can be removed from the bracket, the bracket stays, but the fixture, uh, the, the television can go. And yet, yes, Bob, you would sign the inventory at the same time as the, as the main contract. Okay, other questions before I move on to assignability? Go ahead, unmute yourself or put your question in the chat. Okay, seeing none. Assignability. This contract is not freely assignable. You must check a box or the contract is not assignable. It's very important that you understand that if you're buying to put into a trust or you're gonna put it into an LLC, or you're gonna have somebody else come onto the contract with you, you need to do that up front, or you need to check the proper box for assignability here in section seven. And you have three choices. You may assign and the buyer is released. The buyer may assign, but not be released from liability under the contract, or the buyer may not assign the contract. And if you, and again, the default is may not assign. So be very cautious if you intend to have an assignment. Okay, up next now is the financing. So financing under the Farbar contract is, used to be a little different. I'm not gonna say complicated, but you've gotta be paying attention to your deadlines. If it's a cash transaction with no finance contingency, this contract is very clear. This is a cash transaction with no financing contingency. It says it right here under 8A. If you go to 8B and you're gonna do financing and the contract is contingent on a loan, then you've gotta get into this whole regime here, uh, you know, this page of what is financing and how does it work. You put in, I, I, I happen to think 45 days these days is needed for uh, financing contingencies just to get them done with the lenders, but some lenders say they can get it done much faster. Uh, talk to your lender, understand their process, and put the appropriate time for the financing contingency in this blank right here. Up next, this, this becomes your loan approval period. It's very important that you check the box right here as to what kind of loan you're getting. Is it conventional, FHA, VA? Is it a fixed rate, adjustable rate? Is it either or? Uh, and it's in the loan amount in paragraph 2C above. That's the line we talked about above where you put in the amount of the loan. And then you put in your initial interest rate, not to exceed here. Um, if you don't put in a in something in this blank here, you have to deal with the prevailing rate based on the buyer's credit worthiness. Um, and then you put in the term of the loan here above appraisal. This is the financing, another defined term. And Notice this and right here, this is new after the LaFont case. LaFont, remember, said that the uh, buyer has to apply for the loan stated in the contract. And it also, and it said in that case that, that getting an not getting an appraisal for the correct loan is tantamount to a breach of contract. So what they did here, what the committee did is they said, and in addition to getting the loan approval, in the loan approval period, you also have to get the appraisal in the loan approval period. What does this mean? Under FARBAR, you do not wait to pay for that appraisal. You have to counsel your buyers. You have to get the appraisal ASAP, pay the $500 or whatever the lender is charging and get the appraisal done up front in the loan approval period. Uh, this is another reason going back up here to line 90 why I say give yourself 45 days to, um, to get the loan approval complete. Okay, so the buyer shall make application for financing within so many days, five days is, is more than enough time in my opinion for the buyer to get with their lender and get the application in for financing. 
And then the standard that the buyer has to use in applying for financing is good faith and diligent effort to get the loan approval within the loan approval period. If the loan approval is not gotten within the loan approval period, um, then, or if the buyer cannot meet the terms of the loan approval, then the buyer may terminate and get their deposit back. Okay, the buyer's gotta keep the, the, the seller fully informed about the loan approval process. This is always a question. What happens, does the seller get to know what's going on? Yes, they do under this contract. Okay, if within the loan approval period, the buyer obtains the loan, um, Karen is asking their business or calendar days. These are all calendar days. We'll talk about that, Karen, all calendar days. But if the, if the buyer obtains loan approval, the buyer shall notify the seller. So my question under this is always what happens if the buyer does not get loan approval, but has not been denied, can they terminate? And it looks like under this contract, prior to receiving loan approval, the buyer can terminate so long as they've exercised good faith and diligent effort. So it's very confusing sometimes to the, to the uh, seller when the buyer says, well, I haven't got my loan, I changed my mind, I'm gonna terminate. And the seller says, well, wait a minute, you know, you have to get a loan. And the buyer says, well, I haven't gotten it yet. I'm going to just go ahead and terminate. In my opinion, the buyer probably can terminate under this contract, which gives almost gives the buyer a free look during the loan approval period. Not quite because of the good faith and diligent effort, but it's close. So what happens if the buyer fails to meet the uh, time requirements and the loan approval period expires? Well, then the buyer shall proceed forward with the contract as if it was 8A, that's cash above, and um, the uh, seller then has three days after the end of the loan approval period to either to terminate, and what you do in this three-day period, you're the seller, the loan has not been approved, you don't want to deal with fighting with the buyer. You say, all right, let's just terminate this. I'm out of here. Or you go to closing. And that's really the simplest way to say it under this contract. And if you the if the seller wants to get, the, get rid of the buyer because the buyer doesn't have the loan, they're not going to be able to close. They're not so concerned about the deposit because they're going to resell it quickly. We're in a good market. Um, then the seller can give the deposit back to the buyer and move on to the next. Okay. If the buyer has timely provided written notice uh, and the buyer thereafter fails to close, the deposit shall be paid to the seller. Written notice of loan approval. I need to say. Uh, unless the seller is in default or there are property related conditions of the loan that have not been met. This is another very important point for those of you that sell condominiums. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the new statutes, uh, and new statutory requirements for condominiums. What happens if you've got a loan contingency, everybody's done, everything is good to go, but the Sellers Condominium Association refuses to fill out the Fannie Mae condo questionnaire with the repair addendum attached to it because the, the seller's condominium doesn't know if it's structurally sound anymore based on the happenings at Surfside and the related collapse. Is that a property related condition? I don't know. It's not addressed specifically, uh, but I would, I would argue that it is a property related condition. If the seller does not uh, push their association to get that Fannie Mae questionnaire with the addendum for the condition of the structure done. I think you have a failure of the seller to, to meet the terms uh, of the loan approval and the buyer can get their deposit back. My opinion, I don't know any case law, but I'm sure some is coming. Okay, other financing options. There are two. You can either assume the existing mortgage, which is very favorable right now, considering that interest rates have gone up more than double. It's 
excuse me, or you can do a purchase money note and mortgage to the seller. That's seller financing. We will talk about both of these options a little further when we get to their respective riders, which we'll talk about all the riders here in a little bit. Okay, let's talk about closing costs under this contract. So under this contract, you get um, three buckets of uh, 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 repair limits, we'll call them. Permit limit, WDO repair limit, and the general repair limit. What you do under this contract here, this is cost to be paid by the seller um, as a percentage of the purchase price or a dollar amount, you write in here, here, and here for your general repair, your WDO repair, and your permit repairs, permit limit. Um, typically people leave these blank and it's one and a half percent. I think this is a mistake. Um, one and a half percent of a million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, if you're doing a larger property, of course, if you're doing a smaller property, uh, you may need more than one and a half percent. So I think you can use one and a half percent, but evaluate the property, look at the options and think about how much uh, as a per in percentage terms or dollar terms is the seller willing to risk on the condition of the property knowing that if you leave it blank, you're obligating four and a half percent of the purchase price to repairs and your seller may not be too happy about that. All right, questions. Heather is asking, appraisal like, is excluded from the property condition carve out. Yes, it is, Heather, that's a change in this contract. If the property does not appraise, you better know that during the loan approval period so you can terminate. You can't do it after loan approval period is over. The appraisal is specifically carved out now. All right. All right, so what happens if the maintenance requirements are not completed prior to closing? We'll get to the specific maintenance requirements later, but the answer is you escrow 125% of the estimated cost to complete the repair items of the three, but not in excess of the specific limit. So you've got to, once you figure out your limit, you're making repairs, you're not going to, you're going to get to the closing date, they're not going to be done. But say um, the amount is, the amount needed exceeds the repair limit. And we'll talk about why that's important later. You would only ask for 125% uh, of the, up to the limit. And then, of course, at the end of the escrow period, any unused portion goes to the seller. WDO patty is wood destroying organisms, and we'll talk about that in greater detail uh, when we get to that section 12. So then you have your cost to be paid by the buyer. Notice uh, I should mention this for the seller as well. The municipal lien search. Um, the municipal lien search is paid by the person who pays for title insurance, and we'll talk about that in a second here in one second. We have a question about the 125%. Jeannie, yes, if you have repair escrows, the bank will have to approve them, and they typically won't allow them. So you got to figure that out with either some type of, of uh, closing cost credit or, or an extension. Okay, title evidence and who pays for it. So if uh, paragraph 8A is checked. That's a cash transaction. Uh, then it's five days prior to the closing date to get the title insurance commitment done. Otherwise, it's 15 days prior to the closing date. Um, once the title commitment has been delivered, the seller and the seller, oh, by the way, the seller has five days to deliver their prior policy to the buyer so they can use that as base title. And I'll, I'll deal with base title. And um, uh, that's not something that the realtors really need to deal with, but just know that you should be asking for the owner's prior policy uh, when you take the listing and give it to your favorite title agent as soon as you can uh, so they can start the title process. So it was a question was asked earlier, who pays for title in what county? 
in most of Florida, the seller pays for title, the owner's policy and charges. In Collier County, where I live, the buyer pays. In Miami-Dade, there's its, it has its own separate provision down here where the uh, buyer designates and the seller has to give $200 down here, which I don't fully understand because I don't live in Miami. But, um, or the, uh, the buyer can pay for title and then they would pay for all of the charges, including the lender's, char the lender's title requirements. Uh, Stephanie is asking, is there a percentage of the purchase price buyers can estimate to pay for title insurance and lien search? Yes, Stephanie, it's, it's about half a percent. That's about the best way to say it. It's a little different than that. Depending on the purchase price, it goes down as the purchase price goes up, but it's about half a percent. And Monica says, what happens if the seller cannot find the title policy? Then the seller says, I don't have it. Uh, send an email to the buyer to the buyer's realtor. Seller does not have their prior policy. Uh, and then the buyer's title company or the title company for the seller, if the seller's paying, starts from the beginning. And that implicates the Marketable Record Title Act and a bunch of other things that we deal with in my office. Okay. Questions about who pays for what? Seeing none, that's good. Let's talk about the survey real fast. At least five days prior to the closing, the buyer at the buyer's expense has, can have the property surveyed by a Florida surveyor. And uh, they can, they have, um, the seller, if they have a survey, needs to give their survey within five days of the effective date to the buyer so the buyer can give that to their surveyor. And it's so important to get your property surveyed. Um, you never know what encroachments may be there, what may be added. It's, it's just a good practice for buyers to get a survey. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about that further, we can talk about it offline, but just, just to encourage your, it doesn't, it's, it's not a lot of money for what you get relative to the purchase price. It's usually four or $500. And it tells so much about the property to the for the buyer. It's a huge it's a huge advantage to the buyer to get a survey. Then, of course, there's the home warranty, where the uh, buyer or seller or neither pay for the home warranty. You put the the plan provider. That's the that's the warranty company here, and the amount that it cannot exceed the cost cannot exceed here. And it's you typically, you know, your home tech, your American Home Shield warranty, um, and typically costs a few hundred dollars. Um, special assessments are up next. So at closing, the seller pays the full amount of liens imposed by a public body. Note they even say it right in here. This does not include condo dues, we deal with the condominium assessments on the condo rider and the HOA assessments on the HOA rider. This is just the public body assessments that are certified, confirmed, and ratified before closing. If the uh, assessment is a paid in installments, you pick here whether the seller pays all of them or whether the seller pays everything that comes due prior to closing. If neither box is checked, then the uh, default on this contract is the seller shall pay installments due prior to closing and the buyer pays installments due after closing. So be very uh, mindful of your public body assessments. Uh, for those of you that work on Marco Island, for example, there's a, there's a sewer assessment, there's a water assessment in the Cape, in the Cape area, they're all over the place and you have to look on the tax bill to figure out where they are. Okay, so that's the main portion of the main contract. Now we're gonna get into the disclosures and the, uh, the rest of the contract. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions up to this point? Seeing none, and you can type them into the chat as we go, of course. Ah, uh, disclosures, some basic stuff. Radon gas is naturally occurring. Permits, so the permit disclosure is very interesting. 
except as may have been disclosed by seller to buyer in a written disclosure, seller does not know of any permits may, improvements made to the property which are unpermitted. So if the seller finds open permits, then the seller has to give all the documentation they find to the buyer. But this contract has a representation in it that the seller does not know. I am currently in a battle with another attorney because the seller was in the, the permit that was pulled that the seller did not disclose as not closed was in the name of the seller. And the question is, how can the seller know that the uh, there was a, not a permit? How can they not know about the permit if it's in their name? Well, in my case, the very elderly seller and the permit was pulled almost 30 years ago and never closed out. And now we're fighting about an open permit. So it's very important to do a permit search with your seller upfront. I know that that costs some consternation. Uh, if you call me, I can probably, in most counties, I can probably do it for free and very quickly, at least give you a general idea of the permit situation on a particular property. I know I can do it in Collier County, Bonita Springs, Naples, and Marco. Uh, probably can be done in most counties and most cities now because of uh, city view. But open permits are like the bane of the title of the title world's existence because they're not a title defect, but if they're on the property and they got to be dealt with the closing, invariably we're dealing with them. So if you find a property with open permits, give me a call. We'll get you taken care of. Mold, there's a mold disclosure. Um, the flood zone elevation certificate certification is very important. If you cannot get flood insurance because of, for whatever reason, the buyer has 20 days to terminate this contract. So make sure that you get your insurance person uh, teed up quickly to tell you whether you can get insurance, flood insurance specifically on this property. And of course, insurance is so messed up in this state right now. Hopefully some of the, uh, the governor's new bill will get that resolved. We will see, it will take it some time to work its way out, but just know the buyer has an out if they can't get flood insurance. Uh, you've got your energy brochure, your lead-based paint brochure, and then, of course, your HOA disclosure. This is just a notice that you should be using Rider B, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but um, just a notice that you should be using Rider B to get um, the applicable association information, uh, the required property tax disclosure, and then, of course, the um, FERPTA requirement. Seller shall inform buyer in writing if seller is a foreign person, which and the seller may have to bring cash to closing. So be very careful if you've got a FERPTA withholding. Let's see here. Larry is, oh, insur on insurance. Yes, Larry, yes. Uh, most NFIP flood insurance policies are, are assignable. Uh, Larry, that's a great point. No, good job. Um, most NFIP policies are assignable. So you want to work with the seller's insurance company to get that and the seller to get the, uh, the flood policy assigned. If you cannot get a flood policy um, and it screws up the seller financing, then you're going to have a financing problem, Kim. But the um, uh, that just throws the, the buyer's ratios off. They're not going to get approved for their loan. Bob is asking, when do you get the buyer to sign the disclosures? At the beginning of the process, Bob. Get the seller's disclosure, the, the uh, association disclosures assigned right away. Don't wait because there's a three-day right of re rescission. We'll talk about that when we get to the disclosures. Okay, last disclosure comment. Seller's disclosure. Seller knows of no facts materially affecting the value of real property, which are not readily observable and which have not been disclosed to buyer. Shiny gold star for anybody who knows where this came from. Johnson v. Davis, very important case for realtors, 
very important case for sellers. You cannot, since the 80s, hide defects in a property and sell it. It's, Florida is not a buyer beware state. And very importantly for realtors, this affects you too. If you know that your seller is hiding uh, a latent defect, a defect in the property, and you don't disclose it, the buyer can sue you instead of the seller because you have a separate duty to disclose. Be very careful about that. Uh, Lisa, we'll talk about Chinese drywall when we get to the Chinese drywall disclosure, but uh, you'll want to disclose Chinese drywall. Okay. Property maintenance, conditions, inspections, and examinations. Here we go. Property inspections under this contract are somewhat complicated. The, uh, except for ordinary wear and tear or in casualty loss, the seller shall maintain the property as is as of the effective date. So once you sign the contract, the property is frozen and you need to maintain the lawn, the shrubbery, and the pool in the and the property in the condition it existed as of the effective date. This is your maintenance requirement. If you don't meet the maintenance requirement, there's going to be an escrow of repairs after closing. So how do we deal with inspections? Inspections under the standard FARBAR contract, again, there are three. There's the general, the wood destroying organism, and the permit. Um, okay, before I get to that real fast, Francie has a good question. What are some typical defect disclosures that realtors are expected to know? If you know that the seller's pumping Freon into the air conditioner and painting over the mold that's growing on the wall, you need to disclose that to the buyer. Those are the two big ones. If you if the seller's filling up the air conditioner with Freon every weekend or every week to sh for showings on the weekend, the air conditioner is defective and you're hiding it. You can't do that. I've had that case. So um, let's talk about inspections. Um, the buyer shall have, you know, 15 days is typical. We're seeing 10 days now a lot for inspections to get their general, their WDO, and their permit inspections done. Um, these are the three general inspections that you can do under this contract. You can add mold as an inspection if you use the mold addendum. Um, if the property is not closed and the buyer is done inspections, the buyer is responsible to repair any damage to the property resulting from the inspections and give the seller paid receipts for the work that the buyer had done to fix the property. So the general inspection must be completed by a licensed professional inspector. Um, the buyer within the inspection period has to give notice of the written notice of the uh, defective items as defined in the contract. And then the seller is entitled to a copy of the report from the licensed inspector if the uh, seller so requests in writing. And the property condition, the property has to be, here's the standard, free of leaks, water damage, and structural damage. And everything listed herein has to be in working condition which of course is another standard that the seller has to meet. Things like your exterior door and interior walls, your doors, your windows, your foundations, all have to be structurally sound. Things like your pool equipment, your major appliances, heating, cooling, mechanical, electrical, all that stuff, you know, the seat, the, the dock, watercraft lifts, have to be in working condition. Note in this contract, the torn screens, fogged windows, and missing roof tiles or shingles shall be repaired. For those of you that operate in Southwest Florida, this is different than the neighbor contract, and you need to know that. Cosmetic conditions are not required to be repaired. This is another standard that has to be understood. Cosmetic conditions result, um, I'm sorry, are aesthetic imperfections that do not affect the working condition of the particular item. So what are they, they have a whole list of what is what are what are 
uh, cosmetic, pitted marsite in the pool, tears, worn spots, discolorations in floor coverings, things like that. Things that are in working can have to be in working condition have to be operating in the manner in which it was designed to operate. So those sliders on the balcony lanai, if they stick too much that the door doesn't slide right, that's a defective condition. I get that question a lot. If it's hard to close, maybe because they're heavy hurricane doors, then they may not be defective, but usually the sliders should slide pretty easily. Uh, note here, um, Cracked roof tiles, as opposed to missing roof tiles, are um, uh, not defective. Pavers in the driveway, pavers on the pool deck are addressed right here. Minor cracks in walls, floor tiles, windows, driveways, pool decks, and garages, those are considered cosmetic. But I find it very interesting, they say minor. What is minor versus major? Because if it's a major crack, it's a defective item. So an inch, a half an inch, I don't know. I don't know any case law, although I've looked. So you're arguing over what's a minor crack versus what's a major issue, major crack. What's a you know something that the 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 pool tile is is out of whack a little bit versus completely you know undulating. Um, so talking about the repair requirements, the seller has 10 days after receipt of the notice to make the repairs or get their own report. And I have a whole big note here. And again, I'll say this again, because a lot of people have joined. I'm gonna give you all these notes after this presentation, but I have a whole big note here. The seller only has to make repairs to bring the property into working condition. They have 10 days to fix the repairs if they're under the general repair limit or get their own estimates. If the buyer and seller's reports are different, if the seller and buyer are not arguing about what repairs are cosmetic versus defective, you get a third inspector whose decision is final as to the defect. If the repair exceeds the repair limit that we put above, remember the one and a half percent, then the buyer, the seller can either pay the excess or the buyer can choose what they want to get done. And this is the really interesting part of this contract. If neither party makes the election, then either party can terminate the contract. So if you're the buyer, you either take the property subject to the repair limits with the remainder in their as is condition or the buyer can terminate, which of course drives me a little crazy. But when you're buying properties on the internet and they, don't, and they look a lot nicer than they should, that kind of makes sense. Carol is asking if the insurance requires the water heater or roof to be replaced or to ensure who pays for the water heater or the roof. Carol, that's a negotiation because what's going to happen there is the buyer is not going to get loan approval and the buyer um, needs to, if the buyer doesn't get loan approval, they're going to need to terminate within the loan approval period. So this is a pure negotiation as to who pays for it, whether there will be some type of credit given. Um, you got to go back to either side. Excuse me. If there's a specific form that needs to be filled out for the repairs, no, Don, under the FAR bar, you would need your attorney to draft an amendment to contract to talk about the repairs, or you would just have to give notice in an email. Um, and we'll talk about texting later, but I'm going to say it now. No texting in this contract anymore. Okay, WDO, wood destroying organisms. May, the property may be inspected again by a Florida licensed uh, person for past or present WDO inspections or WDO infestations. And the WDO is anything that means arthropod or plant life, including termites, but not just termites. And then um, it's interesting, this contract says if the seller had a repair contract and the inspector finds past evidence of an infestation, then the, then the seller just transfers their repair contract with a warranty to the buyer and doesn't have to do anything. 
However, if there is a current infestation, then you get into what happens if WDO is found. And that means the seller gets estimates for repairs and reports them to the buyer within 10 days. If the repairs are more than the repair limit specified in section nine above, then the buyer can either pay the excess of the treatment cost and take the, uh, or tell the seller to make certain repairs and take the rest as is. And if the buyer does not make the election, then either party can terminate. And then Bob is asking, if you use the amendment to change the price of the closing date, do you mark through the contract initial and date? Um, Bob, if you're done negotiating and you're already in contract, you would need an amendment. If you're still negotiating, then you can just initial and date. Okay. Building permits. Building permits are very confusing in this contract. Um, Essentially, the buyer could have an inspection and examination of the records and documents of the property. That's like the public record on city view or in the county records to determine if there's any open, expired permits, open permits, or unpermitted improvements. So you're looking for three things in this inspection. And then if they're found, the seller has to give everything they know in terms of documentation in their possession um to the uh to the buyer so they can evaluate jackie one second we'll go back to wdo okay um closing out the permits again you need an appropriately licensed person not later than five days prior to the closing date the, the seller shall have closed all of the permits and the one thing about this is this is where I mentioned before up in section five, you can have up to 10 days extension of the contract if you still need to get the permits closed out and you're waiting for a final inspection. If the cost to close the permits is ex exceeds the permit limit, then um, the seller can pay the excess or the buyer can take as is and get a full credit up to the permit limit. Okay, Jackie, you had a question about WDO, go ahead. Yeah, up in that um, part where it says that if they find active um, wood destroying organisms, I noticed on that paragraph that it's one of the only places I've seen in a contract that it does not give the seller the option to accept it strictly mentions buyer only. I'm kind of reading that as in if there is active wood destroying organisms, the buyer has every right to walk away. He doesn't have to do anything. The seller can't stop it. Am I that's correct? A very, that's a pretty good read of the contract, and I would agree with you. If, if you find WDO in excess in excess of the repair limit, the buyer can walk away. If it's under the repair limit, then the seller's got to fix. So, okay. Um, one. So then after you get all your inspections done, you're ready to close, then on the day prior to closing or on the closing date itself, you do your walkthrough. And I have a note here, it says buyer or buyer's representative. I do not think that realtors should do inspections. I'm pretty sure your broker doesn't want you to do that anyways, but you should either bring the inspector back. Most of them do it for free. Some of them charge a small fee, but bring the inspector back. I just, it's just too much liability. You miss something, next thing you know, your buyer's suing you. So be very careful. Repairs have to be completed in a good and workmanlike manner by a licensed person. Okay. So a lot of the rest of this stuff is not, it's more for the, for the, for the escrow agent. So we're going to skip through some of this. Um, but just know that funds, again, have to be subject to collection. Um, escrow agents require collected funds. So that's going to be uh, an issue. Make sure that you use wires, don't bring checks to closing. If the funds are not collected, that means if you try to bring a check to closing, you're, the buyer is gonna be in breach of contract and lose their deposit. If the, if the closing agent has to sue anybody, they get their attorney's fees paid. So be very careful. Uh, Susan says, what about unpermitted work? Susan, the unpermitted work and open permit standards are the same. 
Um, just briefly, the, there's a, a, you know, be very careful what you say and what you represent. There is a disclaimer here, and there's an indemnity provision here for the brokers, for you, for the realtor. But just be careful what you say. Make sure you don't make any misrepresentations. And don't forget that even with the disclaimers and the and the indemnity, you are still obligated under Chapter 475 to um, deal in you know transaction broker versus single agent and all that sort of thing. Okay, what happens in the event of default? Very simply, if the buyer defaults, the seller can either keep the deposit or they can sue them and try and get the whole and force the sale. If the seller defaults, the buyer can get their deposit back or they can sue for specific performance and try and get the property. If you do any of those things, I should say before you do any of those things, within 10 days of, uh, if you cannot settle the dispute within 10 days, then you go to mediation, mandatory mediation, using the realtor mediation real rules. And if you have a problem where you need to preserve the property, then you can seek injunctive relief. That means get an injunction from the court to protect the asset if it's wasting, if it's falling into the ocean or something. And then of course, either party, the winner gets their attorney's fees paid by the loser. So be very careful. All right, the standards, these are more again for title, but what you're bargaining for is marketable title. So when you're selling a house, you're selling marketable title for residential purposes. Um, another place where you can extend the contract here is the cure period. If the title commitment is only delivered five days prior to closing, which is what's allowed by the contract, the seller gets 30 days to cure. So if a major title defect comes up, the seller gets another 30 days. And then if the buyer allows it, you can extend for an additional 120 days. So be very uh, cautious to get that title ordered right away. In my office, uh, this is kind of like a best practices for title. We order the title commitment immediately. We don't wait and we deliver it to the realtors right away so you know what's going on with the property. And I mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. The survey is so important. If there's a survey uh, 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 survey defect and you waited till five days prior to closing to turn over the survey to the seller, then uh, again, there's a possibility of a 30 or 120 day extension. So get that survey ordered right. We order the survey right away as well, but at least get the buyer to understand they need to survey right away. Okay. The seller is representing that there's access to the property. That's a title issue. You want to make sure you can get to the property by a public road. And then we talked about this before, but the seller needs to provide estoppel letters that match the leases if the property is leased. If the property is leased, you need to deliver a, either estoppel letters or a seller's affidavit that everything is current and up to date. Up next, um, there's you know the there's an affidavit that the seller always signs. We call it a closing affidavit, and it talks about a bunch of items but basically there's no liens. Okay, Bob has a question. Do buyers ever get termite inspections on condos? Yes, they do, and it's a good idea, Bob. Time is of the essence in this contract. It's a very harsh remedy, but you've got to keep your deal moving forward. Don't miss deadlines in the FAR bar contract. Deposit deadlines, inspection deadlines, title commitment deadlines, financing deadlines, time is of the essence. The contract will be terminated automatically. I'm gonna have an email come out on this probably at the end of the week. Um, you can't miss your deadlines in the FAR bar contract. Calendar days are used, Saturdays, Sundays, and public holidays. Uh, if the deadline lands on one of them, then it moves to the next business day 
For those of you that have used the FAR bar contract or the FAR bar as is for some time, note that there was a change to the contract and it is no longer 5 p.m. on the next calendar day. It's 11.59 p.m. Okay. Force majeure. Force majeure means hurricanes, floods, endemics, pandemics, extreme weather, acts of God, all those types of exciting things. And um, that means the performance by the buyer and seller are paused for up to seven days after the force majeure event no longer prevents performance, but not more than 30 days beyond the closing date. So make sure that you understand that you can get an extension here. We talked about at the beginning for up to 30 days for force majeure events, like when you can't get insurance. Okay. Marketable title, we talked about that. That's what you're bargaining for, marketable title. The property is closed in the county where the property is located. So for those of you that work in Lee, Collier, Charlotte counties and want to use Miami title agents, that's technically a no-no, but it happens all the time. Okay, the um, up next really are the most, the FinCEN reporting. Uh, this is for those of you in Miami, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. Um, you have special requirements. You have to report the individual person who is on the contract, not uh, not the LLC if it's over three hundred thousand um, dollars. Okay, up next, prorations and credits. So the Taxes, the association fees, the insurance that's a that's assumed, any rents all have to be current and they are uh, prorated. So that means that we calculate the days uh, of you of use of the specific item, whether it's the association or the rent, and we take it to the day of closing. Okay. Access to the property. I get this question all the time. It's a cash deal. Do I have to let the appraiser in? Yes, you do. If the uh, and you have to have the utilities on so it can be properly appraised. Okay, 1031 exchanges. I get this question a lot. Do I have to put special language in my contract for 1031 exchanges? No, you do not have to put special language in your contract. It's already there. Okay. Uh, up next, the integration clause, very important clause. This contract contains the full and complete understanding and agreement of the buyer and seller. So if you had a nice conversation about the furniture, but you didn't put it in the contract, but it's in the MLS listing, the furniture does not convey unless it's in the contract. So the person who asked earlier about the microwave, if it's not in the contract, it does not convey. I do a whole class on FERPTA. Just know the seller pays the costs of getting the FERPTA filing done. Okay, last part of the contract here. If you have additional things that you need to enter, like if you're selling in a condo or a homeowner's association or you're doing seller financing, you check the appropriate box and please do not forget to attach the writer. Don't just check the box. Don't just attach the rider. Do both. Check the box and attach the rider. Last thing on this contract before I get into the as is real quick. There's only one thing on the as is to talk about, and that's the as is. Uh, this additional term section should not be used without a lawyer. It's practicing law to draft contract language. Get it blessed by your favorite closing attorney. They all do it for free but have run that language that you put in this section by an attorney. Okay, and that takes us through the contract. Let's talk briefly about the as is. Can everybody see the as is? Okay, good. So all that repair stuff, WDO repair limits and everything else that we talked about um, doesn't apply in the as-is contract. The as-is contract is a free look during the period stated here up here. 
you know, whether it's 30 days or five days um, for inspections, it's a free look to the, um, to the buyer. The only thing that's really different here is the seller has to cooperate in closing out permits, providing the information that the seller has in their possession. Uh, the seller does not have to close open permits in an as-is contract. Okay, we have a question. In areas where both Nabor and Farbar are used, one, which is more advantageous? Don, that's a great question. Which is... Uh, more important, or which contract is better? It depends. Do you have the buyer? Do you have the seller? What's the status of the property? It's a case-by-case -case evaluation, and I'm happy to go through each case with any of you. If you have any questions about that, just give me a call, and we can talk about your individual circumstance. And then Bob is asking, is the as-is the most used contract? By far, the far bar as-is contract is the most used contract in the state of Florida. Okay, let's talk quickly about the riders. If you have a personal interest in the property, you have to put your role in the transaction on this rider AA and disclose it. If you're in Miami-Dade, you have to disclose the special taxing districts. You enter the name of the districts and the type of improvements and you submit this with your offer. Okay, the condo writer. So the condo writer has changed and I'm actually gonna switch here, this one. The condo writer, oops, I, gave, I apologize, I put the wrong one up. This is the highlight of that. The condo rider has a number of things that have to be reviewed and checked. Is there an association approval? Is it required or not required? Uh, if it is required, the seller shall initiate the process. So the seller should get the um, application and they should get the approval taken care of. If there's a, help, I'm sorry, they should help get the approval taken care of. If there's a right of first refusal, it may be to the association itself, or it may be to the members of the association, and you need to find out in, uh, and dis disclose in writing whether or not that right exists, and you need to check these appropriate boxes, and then your specific association will go through that process with you. I've only seen a right of first refusal one time in Naples, and, uh, um, it didn't go well because the association wanted to exercise it and the buyer wanted to fight it. The buyer can't fight it. So that's the short answer to that. That was the end of that case. Here in section three, you can disclose when the association dues are payable and to whom. There are um, current associations, more than one associations, and then current rent or recreation fees can also be added. Okay, if there are special assessments, then you have to report anything that's been on the minutes or on the agenda of the association within the previous 12 months. What does this mean? Very, very important that you know the communities in which you are selling. You've got to know what you're selling, where you're selling and what the rules are because you got to disclose it on the contract. And then you pick whether the buyer or seller pays the installments due before or after closing. Um, if they're not pending, then the seller pays the amounts due before closing and the buyer pays the amounts due after closing. Okay. If you're selling a tower, perhaps on the beach, good luck to you. Uh, you have to know about the sprinkler retrofit if, there, if it's an older building and um, and then you also check here whether the, the buyer has been provided a copy of the association documents. Remember, there are six of them, the, the declaration, the articles, the bylaws, the rules, and the most recent year-end financials, the frequently asked questions, and 
don't forget the condo governance form. If those documents have not been provided, then you check box B. But remember, regardless of whether you have to provide them or not, the buyer always gets a three-day right of rescission. So it's better to provide them up front and get that taken care of. If you can check the box here for requesting the documents, requesting the documents here. Uh, if you've received them, only if you've received them, you can check the box seven. And then if you've got common elements that go with the property, put them here in section eight of the rider. And note here, inspections do not extend to the HO or to the condominium property, only to the unit. Okay, we have a question from Bob. Um, Alan, I'm sorry, Alan is asking if the, if the condo association fill, should fill out the rider. No, Alan, you need to know your community and you fill out the rider with the buyer or, or and get help from the listing agent. And then you say, who reviews the financials for the buyer, Bob? Typically the buyer would have their accountant do that. Okay, up next is the homeowner's disclosure. Note, this is a mandatory form, a statutory form for selling in an HOA. Please be careful with it. You put the amount of the current assessment here and how often it is paid here. You put any special assessment amounts here and how often they're paid here. If there is a, a capital contribution fee, does anybody know where that goes on this form? That's right, it doesn't go on this form. It goes, does not go in this statutorily required section that is signed by the buyer. Where it goes is down here. So you would put one time capital contribution fee to the association or to the foundation here. Oops, I skipped the approval. If there's an approval requirement, you check the box. And again, the seller initiates the approval process with the homeowners association. Okay, next up is the is Rider BB for binding arbitration, which um, if you want to use arbitration, you can. I don't like arbitration, but you can always use arbitration as an alternative to suing each other. I think that suing each other works better because um, you settle faster usually. Okay, seller financing. I'm seeing a lot of seller financing right now with all these interest rates being so high, sellers are taking advantage. So just know for seller financing that there's a one property exclusion and a three property exclusion. If the seller is the owner of, obviously the owner of the property and they're a natural person and they did not build the property and they're not negatively amortizing the loan, then they can do seller financing. You would, pick first or second mortgage, the amount of the mortgage and the interest rate. You pick the terms. You can only pick one of these sets of terms highlighted here. You cannot be creative with seller financing under Dodd-Frank. So check one of these boxes and then we will calculate the required interest and payments and do all that for you. And you put in here your annual payments, monthly payments, quarterly payments, how much it's gonna be, this, this includes interest. If you're doing an interest only, we need to specify that. Okay, assumptions. So lenders are not gonna allow assumptions right now because interest rates are changing so much. But if you can somehow finagle an assumption, then the um, this addendum is great. You put the amount of the loan here, the interest here, any additional interest rate that will be paid by the buyer goes here and any mortgage charges go in here. If you're gonna do vacation rentals, this is a new form. Jackie's asking, but we'll get to FHA and VA in a minute, Jackie. Um, if you're doing vacation rentals, then you as the buyer, may want to approve future rentals. Use form DD 
check here whether the seller is allowed to enter into rentals after the effective date, and then check here if the buyer is going to approve or not. Okay, FHA VA loans. If you are doing an FHA loan, then you need to put the appraisal amount here. This is typically the purchase price. Check the box. And then, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This is the repair limit in the first, in section two. If the cost to the seller should not exceed this amount, the seller could be obligated to pay this amount. Then you check the box. Then you put the appraisal amount, which is typically the purchase price here. Larry is asking if you submit the HOA disclosure at the same time as you submit the contract. Yes, you do. If you're doing VA financing, then you check the box down here. And then the seller could be obligated to pay VA fees up to $250 if you leave it blank. I typically see this put in at zero because sellers don't like to pay VA fees. Okay. So there used to be more favored things called PACE loans. If you come across a property when you're looking at the tax bill and you see a loan for uh, improvements, it should say property assessed clean energy. If you see that, you need this disclosure. And let me just tell you that from a title perspective, PACE loans are very dangerous. Be very careful and call your favorite title agent right away if you see a PACE loan. Okay, if it's a cash deal, you don't need an appraisal contingency in a loan transaction. It's already assumed. It's in, it's in, it's in standard uh, 8B. But if you are doing a cash deal and you want an appraisal contingency, you would use a Rider F. You have the date by which the appraisal must be complete, the amount by which by which the property must appraise. If you leave it blank, it's the purchase price. And if you don't get your appraisal done on time and you don't deliver it, then, then the contingency is waived. If the property does not appraise, the buyer can terminate. Okay, short sales. So I'm very nervous that I'm gonna start seeing more short sales because I've been getting questions about them. In short, if a property is not going to sell for enough money to cover the cost of the loan, you use the short sale approval contingency uh, rider G. And what you really care about is that the seller gets the loan deficiency judgment waived. Everything else is negotiable, but if the seller is gonna be on the hook after closing for the loan amount, that's usually a problem for the seller and it gives the seller an out. Okay, if you wanna make your prop, your contract contingent on getting either homeowners or flood insurance, you would use Rider H and you put the amount or the percent of the purchase price and the date by which the, the property needs to be insured. Um, with insurance market being the way it is, I'm starting to see more of these. It's an important document, Rider H, and you may wanna start using this in your contracts. Uh, just, yes, Jack, you have a question about this? Just make sure that you fill this out correctly. Yeah, the, the question that I have is, is I kind of came across this with the general repairs contract. Uh, if And I threw this on because I was concerned about the life of the roof and it was a cash offer. Um, we found out that the insurance was going to be extremely expensive and the listing agent and seller attempted to force my customer into citizens insurance, thinking that that was going to be the lowest one. Can they, if even with this, can they force us to take a subpar insurance company? Luckily, if citizens was too high as well, but that's a question if I have it, for you. If it says right here, citizens. So okay. if, it, if it meets the citizen's requirements and it doesn't exceed the amount that you put in this blank right here, then yeah, the buyer's got to go forward. Okay, this was a while ago. Is that new? I uh, know. No, this has been around for a while. Wow, that's weird. I don't. I did not even see that. 
I'm just saying that it's, it's new to use it a lot. I'm seeing more of it. Okay, mold inspections. If you wanna get a mold inspection, then you have so many days, 20 is the default to get the inspection done. And if the cost of the mold remediation exceeds the amount that you put in this blank, $500 is the default, then you would uh, have a buyer would have a right to terminate. Uh, most title companies don't use interest-bearing accounts that they that or at least ones that they're willing to share with this with the customer. But if you um, want in your if you have a large enough deposit and you want an interest bearing and you would use Rider J and you would negotiate that with your title company. Okay. For whatever reason, if you are on the regular FAR bar contract and you want to convert it to an as is, then you attach Rider K. Uh, this would be like used in negotiations if the buyer comes in on a regular and the seller wants an as is because they're not going to make any repairs. The seller would come back with Rider K. And then the buyer has so many days for inspections, typically 10 to 15, and this becomes an as-is contract. This is the have your cake and eat it too rider. Uh, the, the buyer can have a right to inspect and right to cancel the contract, but the seller still has to make the repairs identified by the buyer if the buyer moves forward. So it's kind of like the set, the buyer can get out if they want. I've actually never seen this used. It's so buyer buyer centric that sellers would typically reject this, although it is available if you need it. Okay, defective drywall. Um, so back in like 2005, six, seven, there was a drywall shortage in the last housing boom. And by the way, if you look at the permits from that time, they're like three times or two times the number of permits being pulled during this housing boom. So it is a um, not as big a deal. We don't have a drywall problem now, but from back then there was a bunch of sulfur and methane in the drywall that they were getting from China. It was called Chinese drywall, it was a big mess. If you think that that's a problem, if you smell sulfur in the property, you would use the defective drywall addendum, uh, but this shouldn't be a problem too much anymore. Okay. Up next, the coastal construction control line. Uh, if you are privileged enough to sell properties on the beach, be aware of the coastal construction control line because it, it does not prohibit, but it puts special requirements on buildings along the beach. You need to know whether you're on, that, on the uh, water side of it and check the appropriate box. Uh, to determine whether you're in the uh, CCCO area. If you're selling new construction on this con on the far bar contract, which you should not do, you, you need to disclose the type of insulation, get with your builder, and they'll give you the numbers to fill in the chart here. If you sell a house prior to 19, that was built prior to 1978, you need the lead-based paint disclosure. Prior to 1978 means December of 1977 or before. So be careful about that. One thing that's very important to note on the, on the lead-based paint disclosure is licensees sign it. You have to make sure that you've done this correctly because you're signing it and you are liable for it. So be very careful on older properties to know about the lead-based paint requirements, which basically means the seller says what they know about the property, the buyer acknowledges receipt of the information, and then you acknowledge that you have made sure everybody complied with the law. If you're selling in, a, in an older community, uh, I don't mean an older, an old, a community for older persons, you need to disclose that so the seller would provide this uh, with to the buyer if the buyer doesn't provide it in their offer and you check the box. Most of them are 55 plus. Excuse me. If your property needs to be rezoned, then you really, if the property needs to be rezoned, you really are probably dealing with new construction or developments and you should not be using the FAR bar contract. 
But if you are and you use the FAR bar contract and the property has to be rezoned, typically the residential use from agricultural is what I've seen a lot of, then you would put the zoning category here and you would pick under which ordinances you're using, city or county, and you put the date by which the thing, the rezone has to be complete. And then the closing has to occur within so many days after the, the uh, public hearing is done. Tony says, is the lead-based paint disclosure in the seller's disclosure? No, Tony, we've got to use the form that I just provided. It's, it's contains specific federal language, federal law language. Okay, the lease purchase option, one of the last ones we're going to look at here. We got a few to go, but the lease purchase option, I, I really do not like this form. Uh, it's very confusing as to whether it seems like if you're going to enter into a lease, then first, then you should present the lease, get paid on the lease, your commission, and then get your purchase commission when the property goes to sale, um, which I think is a better deal for the realtor and for the buyer and seller, uh, trying to put a contract together and then come back and fill in a lease or an option to me is doing it backwards. If you're gonna do a pre-closing occupancy, or a post closing occupancy, then you can you would use these uh, riders and you have to enter into a separate agreement. Um, that's fine. We can do that. I have forms for that. They're very easy to use. So just give me a call. We'll enter into a post closing or pre closing occupancy agreement as needed. If the buyer needs to sell the property first, you use rider V. You put the address of the property. You put the date by which the property must be sold. And then you put whether it's under contract or not. And if you don't meet the contingency, the buyer can terminate. Okay. If the seller wants to get backup contracts, the seller always can backup contracts, but um, you need to put this rider W on the backup contract so that the seller doesn't sell the property twice. This adds the contingency that the um, uh, seller does not have to sell to this seller until the other contract falls apart. Up next is the kickout clause. Um, it's basically, the seller has the right to continue to show the property. And uh, if they enter into a backup contract, then the uh, primary contract party has to make an additional deposit and waive of the contingencies, all contingencies for financing and everything else. Um, and then the buyer can stay in the deal. Otherwise, the seller can kick you out and move to the backup. Now, the one thing about this contract, this kickout is sellers want to keep it active in the MLS. You cannot do that. That's got to be marked pending. That's an MLS rule. It's not a contract. Okay, last few. If the seller's attorney um, is going to approve or the buyer's attorney is going to approve, then you would use riders Y or Z and uh, have a certain number of uh, days, usually you put the date in here, <coughs> excuse me, or here, and you would have, you the seller's attorney would have time to approve the contract. And with that, those are the riders and the addendum. Does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Any more questions? Let's see what we got in the chat here. Yes, Teresa, the buyer should fill out the condo rider. Um, it's the, the accuracy is basically the seller's responsibility, but the, uh, the seller, the listing agent and the buyer's agent should be working together in an HOA to make sure that they're getting it done. Other questions? 
I hope you guys all learned a lot. I know it was a little longer than I usually go, but I really wanted to get involved. Thank you all very much. I will email my notes to everybody um, shortly. I got to get the video processed. That takes a little while. But thank you all very much, and I will talk to you all soon. Take care.